In this video, I will take a break away from hard Kenyan politics to look at something else outside politics. Okay? But it's an interesting event, yeah, unfortunately a tragedy, yeah, involving Kenya's national carrier, Kenya Airways. Now, Kenyan pilots have got quite a good reputation worldwide. Yeah, uh, you'll always hear any part of the world, you'll hear people saying Kenyan pilots are good. Yeah, but unfortunately in this particular incident, Kenyan pilots did not look so good. Okay, but let's get on to it right away. I'm of course talking about the events of uh, 5th May 2007 in Douala, Cameroon. The Kumekucha blog was of course up and running, in fact very active that year. Okay, and the first initial reports we received is that uh, Kenya Airways flight had vanished from the face of the earth. Nobody had any idea where it was. Now ordinarily, that is virtually impossible. An airline just doesn't disappear. Yeah, an airline is tracked on radar, especially near an airport. Yeah, and uh, well, right through its journey, you are able to track and know exactly where an airline is, where an aircraft is. To us ordinary citizens, this was something which was discomforting, yeah? How does an aircraft disappear, vanish, yeah? And of course, this was long before the Singapore incident, eh? And by the way, here that aircraft has never been found. Anyway, experts of course knew the probability, exactly what would have happened, yeah? But uh, they kept mum, yes? They knew that when an aircraft takes off and then uh, disappears shortly after, what it means is that it has crashed. And chances are that uh, whatever tracking instrument uh, that uh, was on the aircraft was destroyed maybe in an impact which was uh, very great. Yeah, Experts already knew that. But the rest of us were in the dark. You can imagine the anxiety amongst the relatives and uh, friends of those who are on, booked on that uh, airline. Yeah, Gosh, it must have been crazy. Two days later, two days. Can you imagine that? First day, nothing. And of course, the search effort was hampered by very bad weather, okay? And even there had been one false alarm that uh, the aircraft uh, wreckage had been spotted a full 120 kilometers away from the airport, yeah, which deepened the mystery. Anyway, after two days, the wreckage was found in a swamp that was not too far from uh, uh, Dola International Airport. Now, initial reports, which we covered very well in our blog, was that at the time the aircraft uh, took off, yeah, the weather was very, very bad. In fact, another aircraft opted uh, to wait out the weather. But uh, this particular KQ flight had already been delayed earlier, and I guess the pilots were anxious uh, to get to JKA, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. You know, as a pilot, you have uh, passengers in aircraft who are looking for connection flights and so on, and so you don't want to inconvenience them, yeah? So this aircraft took off in very bad weather and initially it was speculated that um, probably the bad weather caused uh, the crash. Now I know many of us have not been able to witness a full tropical storm. I mean that thing is crazy, yeah? <laughs> and where Cameroon is and where Douala Airport is, they experience quite a bit of that, yeah, once in a while. So for those who have uh, experienced this, uh, it came straight to their minds that actually, yeah, there were a lot of factors that would have uh, caused uh, the aircraft to just fall off the sky. But of course not aviation experts, yeah, who know a modern aircraft can fly literally through anything. Yes, where well, there's a factor, but uh, <laughs> if you're a pilot who knows what they're doing, yeah, uh, an aircraft can fly literally through anything, a modern aircraft. And in any case, another aircraft had just left moments earlier and it had flown uh, safely through to its destination. But as the days dragged on, other theories came. Yeah, Apparently the flight uh, captain was a Captain Batia, 52 years old, veteran pilot with a lot of experience. Yeah, But he had uh, a first officer who was only 23, a yeah, very young guy. In fact, for comparison's sake, uh, the captain had been flying <laughs> for as long as uh, his first officer had been alive. <laughs> yeah? And so there was a theory that uh, maybe the first officer took over control and uh, he messed up and uh, brought the aircraft down. And so rumors and speculation kept on flying all over the place. 
even as the dreary affair of recovering the bodies uh, started, yeah, now the aircraft had gone nose down in a very swampy area, okay, and uh, recovery, of course, was very difficult. In fact, even access to the area was extremely difficult, yeah. Major uh, media houses in Kenya actually sent reporters there, and uh, the photographs, images they brought back uh, were very disheartening yeah, and horrifying, if I may say that, even as they edited out most of uh, the really, really bad details. Now, as you know, 2007 was quite a year politically for Kenya, so the country went through the storm. The country was very busy. The country was busy with the Grand Coalition government that followed in 2008, and this uh, aircraft accident was totally forgotten. So that by the time the report by investigators were re was released, yeah, three years later in 2010, very few people paid attention to it, yeah. And in any case, uh, the Kumekucha blog by that time, <laughs> uh, I was in retirement. <laughs> Actually semi-retirement. And uh, very shortly after that, I was going to go into what I thought would be permanent retirement, away from politics forever, yeah, and uh, try to get a life. <laughs> because uh, as some of you know, reporting politics, huh, it's not really a real job, it's a hazardous undertaking, yeah. Anyway, so in 2010 when the report came out, very few people paid attention, yeah, and uh, it did not receive the attention it should have received from the Kumekucha blog. Uh, my apologies. But I guess uh, better late than never. Okay, so today we are going to look at that report and it is absolutely fascinating. And we'll do that after this short upcoming break. See you on the other end. Welcome back. Now I appreciate uh, there are quite a number of people taking this channel who do regular flying. Yeah, so maybe it's a good idea before we go into this report uh, to examine a few very fascinating statistics. Okay. Now, uh, out of all accidents, aircraft uh, crashes, yeah, seventy percent always come down to pilot error. Okay. Now that is amazing. Out of every ten crashes, seven will be due to pilot error in that the pilot would have done something to save the situation, yeah? However, to be fair to pilots, when something goes wrong up there, in many instances, somebody has only a few seconds, yeah, to make the right decisions or to make the wrong decisions and to bring the plane down. Now, these instances where something goes wrong are very, very few. I mean, a pilot could experience only one in his lifetime, <laughs> yeah? In this case, they survive it, yeah, they experience one, they get through it, and during their whole entire career until they retire, nothing happens again, yeah. 
You know, if something is frequent, then you become more alert and more prepared. But when something can come out of the blue, and sometimes you don't even know there's a problem until it's too late, yeah, uh, then you, you understand, yeah. And uh, of course, you, you will not say uh, pilots are incompetent. You will not start blaming pilots. Yeah, this is just the way the aviation industry is. Now, the other important statistic uh, emphasizes the fact that actually flying is extremely safe. Yeah, I know when you're thirty thousand feet up there in the clouds, many of us, including myself, <laughs> never feel safe and are never comfortable until the aircraft finally lands. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, however, the statistics tell us that actually if you're to get onto an aircraft every day, yeah, wait for this, it would take you 26,000 years to be involved in a fatal uh, crash. Yeah? I did not say 26. I did not say 260. I said 26,000 years. What? Now, according to statistics and probability and so on, yeah, even... Uh, after those 26,000 years <laughs> and you're in this crash, your chances of survival would be pretty good. Yeah. So bottom line, flying is extremely safe. And I don't think I need to emphasize this to Kenyans who use our roads in Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our roads are a death trap. Yeah. So compared to flying, uh, flying is much, much safer yeah, than getting onto the road to go to Kisumo or Mombasa, you know. Anyway, the investigation into the accident of Flight 507 in Douala, Cameroon, was hit with a snag right at the beginning because they could not find the cockpit voice recorder. Now, the cockpit uh, voice recorder, or black box as it's widely known, uh, but actually it's not, it's, it's actually uh, orange, it's not black. <laughs> but it's called black box, okay? Now, naturally, because the aircraft had gone nose down a, in a swamp, uh, of course, it was understandable how difficult it would be to trace it. In fact, some ep experts at the beginning said the possibilities were high that it would never be found. But finally, with the help of uh, uh, aviation experts from the United States and elsewhere, it was finally located on 15th June, yeah? a full one month, 10 days after the accident. And oh my, it told quite a story, yeah, a scary story actually, yeah, of exactly what had happened in the last moments of flight 507, KQ-507. And this is what happened. When the flight took off, immediately it was airborne, it started banking to the right, yeah, tilting towards the right, okay. The pilot uh, noticed this, okay, and corrected the situation. And the aircraft continued climbing. Now remember it was a very dark night and there was a storm. So visibility was uh, virtually zero. Yeah, it was just darkness out there. And so according to experts, what the pilot should have done immediately would have been to, to do what is standard yeah, in safe flying. Yeah, which is instrument scanning. Because the instruments would have told him exactly what was happening with the plane. Yeah, but he didn't do that. Now, the CVR also confirmed something else, yeah, the cockpit uh, voice recorder. It confirmed that uh, the person on the controls was not according to the rumors, uh, the younger man, but was actually the very experienced uh, Captain Batia. Now, unfortunately, the aircraft continued banking to the right, okay? And at one point, uh, the pilot uh, ordered his first officer to engage uh, the autopilot, now, the autopilot is where, of course, the aircraft is flown by computer, yeah, so the computer does all the necessary corrections, yeah, and uh, it should have gotten uh, the crew out of trouble. But there was no confirmation from the first officer that he actually engaged the autopilot, yeah, and uh, Captain Batia did not go out of his way to confirm that actually the autopilot had been engaged. So what followed were 55 deadly seconds. Now, within these 55 deadly seconds, the aircraft was not being flown by autopilot, and neither was it being flown by the pilots. It was literally flying itself. Captain Batty, of course, assumed that the autopilot was on, but it was not. Now, within that period, the aircraft continued to bank, yeah, tilt, and the tilt moved from 11 degrees to 34 degrees. 
and at the end of this 55 seconds is when uh, Captain Batia realized what was happening and uttered the words, we are crashing. Now, this is where something called spatial disorientation kicked in. Okay, This is where you do not know you're in space and you do not know the position of your body. That is, you could be upside down and you think actually you're upright. Yeah? And that is where the instruments would have come in very handy yeah, to tell the pilots exactly what kind of station they are in. Anyway, what kicked in now was panic. Yeah, because obviously both pilots realized that uh, they, were in a, they were in serious trouble and they had only a few seconds to correct the situation. Now, what followed was a few seconds where the pilot gave the aircraft instructions that were the direct opposite of what the first officer was giving. Yeah, so the pilot was doing his own things and the first officer was doing his own things, all in a very panicky effort to save the situation. Understandably so. Captain Batty realized what was happening and he finally engaged the autopilot. By this time, the aircraft was at 2,290 feet and it had tilted a whole 115 degrees. By this time, of course, it was way too late. And uh, from 2,290 uh, feet in the air, on that dark night in Douala, Cameroon, the aircraft came nose down straight into the swamp, killing all those who were on board. Now, <laughs> I have no respect for armchair analysts. You know, you cannot start saying, oh, you should have done this, you should have, they should not have panicked, etc., etc., because you are not there. And you're not in that situation. That's how life is. My deep and sincere condolences to all those who lost loved ones on this uh, aircraft, and especially the Kenyans. Yeah. But uh, that's how it was. Until next time, this is Chris Komekucha.